This is the third part in the In Hibernate series. In this episode, Chad will continue his dive into how to configure In Hibernate. He'll also take a look at how to bootstrap In Hibernate and configure it for your session factories. So this is it. This is a real simple mapping. You know, we have a class, we have an ID with two properties, um, and we can actually um, save and load this. I, I do want to cover one more entity though before we get into the how to actually run In Hibernate. So I have a customer object here. This is slightly more complicated. Um, some of the stuff we're, we're going to get into later, so I'm just going to kind of skim over. But it's a public class customer, no interfaces, no nothing. It's got an ID, a first name, a last name, and a created date, which we have a default for, which is now. Um, and then it's it's related to a store. So every customer has a store. Um, they have to have a store. It's non-null. And then they have a list of orders. We'll get into list mapping in, in a little bit. That's a little more involved. And then so we look at the mapping here. Same thing as what store was. Um, for now, ignore, ignore this bag here. We'll get to that later. But the uh, the when you're relating from, you know, you may have many customers related to one store. Um, so that's called a many-to-one relationship or an MTO <coughs> in uh, in Hibernate parlance. There, there's it supports in Hibernate supports many different types of relations. We'll, we'll get to some of those in the future. This is this is uh, one of the easier ones. So what we do is we tell it uh, what our property name is. So we can have it primary store or main store or in this case I'm just calling it store. And then you have to tell it what class it's actually mapped to. Um, I think in some cases in Hibernate can actually infer the type, but uh, I like to be a little more explicit. So I'm, I'm going to tell in Hibernate it's a store class. I have to tell it what my join column is. Um, and, and then uh, Cascade is, is a slightly different thing. We'll actually get to that a little bit later. So in Hibernate can actually, uh, you don't have to tell it every single thing to do. It can actually infer through relationships how it's supposed to interact with the database. We'll get to that in a second. So we have a kind of a basic mapping here, a, a basic domain. Um, we have a store and we have a customer that's related to a store. <clears throat> so now how do we actually use and hibernate? So let's get to that. So like I said, I have a console application here. I've added a reference to and hibernate and a, and a reference to my core application, which contains my domain. Uh, it's a console application. I, all the guts are in this tools folder. You don't need to worry too much about that. There is one thing, though, uh, you do have to tell in Hibernate, you know, your connection string, you know, it has to connect to the database somehow. It actually uses ADO.NET under the hood. It'll use the SQL client for a SQL server, the Oracle client for an Oracle, um, and so forth. Or, you know, if there's third party, you know, DB2 has its own ADO.NET provider, it can use that. But it does need a connection string, and you need to tell it what type of database you're connecting to. It can't actually infer that by itself. You actually have to tell it. So there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can either um, configure it via code and, and just have it, you pass in an I dictionary that has name value pairs of, of your configuration. Or uh, you could have an XML file on the, on the disk um, called hibernate.cfg.xml. It's a magic name that it will automatically find that. Or you can put, have it as a configuration section in your app.config or web.config if you're in a web project. So I, I chose to go the app, con, app config route because it's just easier uh, for, the, for the demo purposes. So, you know, uh, standard kind of config section stuff. You can find this in the documentation. I, I won't go into the, <clears throat> I won't read the full type name. There's examples of this on the, on the website that I mentioned earlier. And then you need to add the Hibernate configuration element. You can actually, no, I think you have to call it Hibernate configuration. And then you'll notice here we also have the XML NS, and then uh, the IntelliSense comes up, and th this is the second schema that comes within the Hibernate, which is the configuration uh, schema. So this will give us IntelliSense for configuring. The next tag is session factory, and then you have a bunch of name value pairs here, basically. So um, this connection provider is pretty much the only connection provider that comes within Hibernate. Um, they allow for a lot of customization, but the, the one that ships with it um, is this just generic driver connection provider. And then dialect is what actually translates what an Hibernate wants to do with the database to the actual dialect or vernacular of the database, you know. So older versions of Oracle didn't support SQL 92 joins. Everything had to be, you, you know, either use the join operators or just put everything in the where clause. So the Oracle dialect knew, or the Oracle 8 dialect or whatever, knew how to 
how to handle that, whereas the MS SQL 2000 did support SQL 92 joins, and so it would take advantage of join syntax if you, if and Hibernate decided the join was the most appropriate thing to do in that, in that place. And then uh, the driver is actually the thing that, you know, news up a new SQL connection. So there's these, these three things are the primary things you need for the conf configuration. Finally, of course, you need connection string. And then I have another option. There's an optional kind of debugging setting here I have called show SQL. And this is, you don't, you don't want to have this on norm, or, you know, uh, I'm sorry, in production. This is only for development purposes. It, it console.write lines all the SQL it generates. So it's handy in, in you know, presentation like this where you can actually see the SQL it's spitting out. Um, of course, you could use SQL Profiler and you can see the SQL that in Hibernate is generating, but um, I don't want to fire up SQL Profiler, so it's easier just to dump it to the console. <clears throat> and of course, and Hibernate does support log for net. Um, and it provides much more, uh, a much richer logging experience if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of, of how it's generating its SQL and what parameters it's passing and stuff. But for right now, the show SQL is actually is pretty good. So once we have that, um, uh, starting up in Hibernate involves creating a new configuration object. <coughs> And then you add assemblies to it. Um, and you can do this by name, and it will actually go try to find the DLL on the disk. Um, or you can actually pass in a .NET as reflection assembly object. In this case, it's easiest for us just to pass in the assembly. So I do you know, type of customer, which is in the assembly I want to load everything from. And then I give it that assembly. So in Hibernate, it's actually going to go look. And it's going to try to figure out, is there, is there XML files on the disk? Is there an embedded resource? Oh, it, there is an embedded resource. OK, I'll grab those. And it starts finding all the embedded resources. And you know it finds the store.hbm.xml. And it knows to look for the store class. And then it makes sure everything's kind of cool and everything lines up right. And then um, you know it'll throw an error if it finds something out of whack. Otherwise, it's ready to go. Here, uh, there's a lot of different things you can do on the configuration object. Here's where, instead of doing the XML configuration, I can I can pass in a dictionary. I can actually add mappings on the fly here if I didn't want to do embedded resources, or if I had different file names and I wanted to do something different. Um, here's where I could tell the configuration about my environment. The configuration object actually has a lot of stuff on it. If I bring up the IntelliSense here, you can see it's got it's pretty extensive. Uh, what you can do with it. I won't go into all the details right now. Basically, you just point it at the assembly that has all your mappings in it, and that's good enough. Finally, when, when you're done and it's all configured and you're ready to go, uh, you call build session factory, and that basically locks down the configuration and your prime time now. So you can actually go back later and change the configuration and call build session factory again, but the factory you already created from the previous configuration, it has a snapshot of the configuration, so you can't like go changing things out from underneath it. Once the factory is created, it has a snapshot of everything it's doing. From the session factory, you can actually create sessions. Um, and when you create the session, that's when a database connection is actually opened. Although in some cases, and Hibernate won't actually open the database connection right away. I, I don't want to get too much into the minutia, but um, it can later uh, delay the actual opening of the connection until the first time it actually needs to. That's a performance optimization they added in one of the recent uh, builds of N-Hibernate. <clears throat> so this, this uh, building the session factory can actually be fairly expensive, especially if you have a lot of mappings. This is definitely something you want to do once per application. So uh, you want to put this in your global.asax if you're in a web application or in your program.cs, you know, in a, in a console or a Windows service or a Windows application. You only want to do this once because it, it can take a few seconds if you have, you know, a, a hundred entities. Um, it's a lot faster than it used to be, but it's, it's still an expensive operation. Uh, once you have the factory, though, creating new sessions goes pretty fast. And so um, just, just to show you kind of the guts of what I've got going here. So every time I run this application, it, it clears out everything out of the database. And then it prompts you for which sample you want to run. I'm going to go through some of these samples. Um, and then you know it, it, it's in a tight loop, so we can run different examples. So, but don't get bogged down into my example app here. That's not the point. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the first example which is basic crud.